Financial conditions are tightening and stocks are the last to know. And in today's show, we're going to look at the different ways financial conditions are tightening. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today because the situation is starting to get serious. And if you just look at the equity market, if that's all you focus on is the ticker, you're going to miss it. Today's show is like the seven layer dip of macro. We're going to go through and look at all the different ways financial conditions are tightening and what you should be looking at because the risks are out there. We talked about this on Wednesday, how the Fed is trying to pancake the curve. Some of you said, wow, that's got to be really bullish for stocks. Let's just put it this way. The narrative today is, did the market open? Yes. Well, then it must be bullish for stocks. That's the view. Everything doesn't matter what it is. They're bullish for stocks, but that's not the case because falling yields, they tell you. There's one way that you can see that financial conditions are tightening. So let's jump in and we'll kind of grab some of Wednesday's show and pull it forward with us as we look at these different indicators. Because when you start understanding how yields play in and the dollar plays in and these other indicators play in that you look at, you start to see the big picture and that is tightening financial conditions. All right, let's start out with the first part, which is 30 year treasury yields. Because the idea is, is it lower interest rates mean higher stock prices. And that isn't always the case. When yields tighten and fall very quickly, it tells you that financial conditions are tightening because what does it mean when yields fall? And you can see here, going back to the financial crisis, yields fell. Well, that should have been bullish for stocks and it wasn't. You can see here, yields falling, wasn't bullish for stocks. So when you see these quick move lower in yields, it doesn't always mean, here you see it again, that it's bullish for stocks because why are yields falling? What does it mean they're trying to do? You have to think of it from a lending perspective. When the banking system isn't creating enough new money and putting it out in the system, interest rates have to go down to spur lending growth, to, cre to create dollars. So if the financial system isn't creating enough money to support asset prices and to support the economy, interest rates will be forced down just by the monetary system alone. So that is a form of tightening. And there's a second way we know, because what do banks do when their spread between loans shrinks? Do they lend more? No, they tend to lend less. And so falling interest rates, particularly quickly, rapidly falling interest rates, means that banks tend to lend less and then not until they start lending at those lower rates that we start to see conditions ease. So when you start to see interest rates roll over and head lower, as you see here, that should be a warning sign that perhaps not all is rosy in the equity market. And another area that we need to look at is the money supply because we've heard over and over and over again, and we're gonna get the newest data next week about how the money supply is so bullish because there's all this money slush around. Look at all the money grow. And I want you to be keeping an eye on what happened in the 90s here because it's flattened out. And let's zoom in to what's going on today because what no one's talking about is between May and June, when we still had a, quite a bit of stimulus coming out, the money supply only grew at 17 by 17 billion. And with stimulus running out and unemployment benefits running out, a slowing money supply growth, perhaps even a contracting money supply growth, which we could see, is not bullish for the economy. What you need to see is a consistent expansion in the money supply to help grow the economy. And there again, another sign, financial conditions are tightening. But remember, we talked about the 90s and well, well, things were okay in the 90s because what happened in the 90s is the velocity of money rose. So even though the amount of money in the system did not grow as much, the money that was in the system exchanged hands quicker than it did before. But look at today, money supply growth is lower than it's been at any point since the 19, well, I shouldn't say any point, but one point in the night since the 1960s and it's slowing down because of quantitative easing in that dollar prison that we've talked about many times before. And with that, one of the most important things that you should be looking at is the dollar itself. And a lot of people 
completely misunderstand the dollar. Their natural assumption is the dollar is going to get weak, so the dollar is going to become worthless. Well, let's first look at the chart and try to understand why a rising dollar leads to tighter financial conditions. And you can see that the dollar really hasn't gone anywhere in the past six years. It's about where it was then. And so the notion that the dollar is getting weaker, well, that's not quite true at all, as we can see there. But how do we understand the dollar? So when the dollar is weak, think of yourself as a producer or in, you're selling a good or services to get dollars because we all compete for dollars. If you go to work every day, you're competing for dollars. If you are retired, well, then your investments or your pension or Social Security, that's your former dollars. Those systems are competing effectively for the existing dollars. Now, some have a guarantee in them, which is great. But nevertheless, we're all competing for dollars. And then the whole world, as a world's reserve currency, maybe is either directly or indirectly competing for dollars. So when the dollar is weak, the reason price of goods go up is because you don't need to sell as many goods to get the dollars you need. There's, there's more dollars out there chasing goods. And so you don't need to have a whole lot of production to get the dollars that you need. But when it flips and the dollar goes up in value, because now all of a sudden people want to hold on to them when there's, and so when there's too many of them, you have too many dollars chasing those goods, but when there's not enough of them, or if people are choosing to hold on to them, perhaps the more key part to this ties back to quantitative easing a bit. When you hold on to dollars, then price of goods goes down because people are choosing to hold on to those dollars rather than spend them on goods and services. And if you need dollars, let's say you're an oil producer, and you can't, and you then the dollar is high. How do you get more dollars? You produce more oil and sell it on the market, further driving price down and the dollar higher. And that's why we see those relationships during recessions that the dollar goes up and prices go down because in order to get the dollars you need, you have to sell something to get it. And that's important because in a financial crisis, people make these decisions with their mortgages. What do they do? Well, I, gee, I, I could sell something I have to keep what I want, my house that I can't make the payments on. So maybe I go and sell you know, uh, my toy hauler or something like that to get the dollars I need. So the dollar is important here. And let's dig in because what you see is a dollar looks like it's starting to bottom and perhaps head higher. And that is contrary to the view of many people. But when you understand the monetary base and quantitative easing, and all the monetary base here is doing is showing the Fed's balance sheet. And there is a relationship. It's not directed. They do not move step for step. But as the monetary base increases, so too does the dollar. And why is that? Is because quantitative easing is trapping those dollars in the financial system. So there might be a lot of dollars to go look at. We had the money supply say, wow, look at all those dollars. There's, you know, 20.388 trillion of them. But when you trap them in the financial system, they can't move around much, as you see in the velocity, and it leads to tighter financial conditions. Now we can take that another step onto a weekly chart and look at cash assets at all commercial banks. And the cash is key because not only does quantitative easing create cash in the system, not directly, but by taking away a saver's choices of how to save money. So they choose to save as cash and then quantitative easing gobbles that cash up. So as cash goes up in the system, you might think, well, that would make the dollar weak, but not when quantitative easing is in play. So we know the dollar is going to likely strengthen. The probabilities are that, and it's starting to do that. When it gets over 94, we've talked about this, watch out. But what about the relationship to treasury yields? Because some people say, well, gosh, if the dollars goes up, well, then yields will go up too. Well, I've inverted treasury yields against this because what you need to understand about dollars and bonds is bonds are just a deferred form of dollars. That's it. You put dollars in the bond and you get them back out some point in the future. Could be four weeks, could be 30 years. And in between that point, if the dollar goes up quickly, why do bonds go up with it? Why do yields crash? Because those who own a deferred form of dollars can sell them. So if you own a treasury security, for example, you, are, you can go out to the market anytime. You are not beholden to keep it for the length of 
the term that you purchased it based on. So if it's a five year note, you can sell it at any time. You don't have to keep it for five years. So when you see the dollar go up or you see yields start to go down or worse, you see them start to do that together, it tells you the conditions are tightening. Let's continue because again, some of you are saying this, this can't be too bad for stocks. Well, uh, it's that's why we gotta look at the dollar in relation to equities because you can see a dollar rising along with stocks as long as it's ri not rising too quickly. But when the dollar gets moving too quickly, equities start to flatten out and tend, they tend to correct after that. And if the dollar keeps pushing higher, it can put downward pressure on stock prices. And when you get rather quick moves in the dollar here, they can have a delayed reaction. Or you can see moves here that lead to a sell-off in stocks or a very quick move, and that can crash equity prices. And so as the dollar looks to bottom out, as quantitative easing continues to dig in, and we are not seeing money supply grow, it tells you that the existing dollars in the system are likely to become worth more. And when you start looking forward to the unemployment data, well, it gets even more interesting and we'll get to that. Because what about crude oil? Why is crude oil peaking? Is that a sign that financial conditions are tight? And it is because if you think about it, if, if there's not enough money out there in the system for people to buy something, then what direction does that the value of that good or services need to go? It needs to go lower. So can high crude prices or high um, consumer goods prices be a form of tightening yes because if there's not enough money for them to go buy it then they can't buy as much and price comes down and this is weird because many of you are saying but steve don't you know the inventory levels of crude are falling i do know that i'm very versed in that i watch it like you every week but these higher prices too high perhaps a great story for later with crude prices react to a weaker dollar and we see some change could be a big sleeper investment in the future. But even from a consumer standpoint, we're seeing them stuck in tighter financial conditions when we look at the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey, because what I can't overlay from the Fred database is buying intentions. And buying intentions are way down here below everything. And if I could chart the two together, again, not available on the Fred database, what you would see is buying intentions lead consumer sentiment. So what we're about to see is consumer sentiment crash because consumers are tapped out. They're not interested in buying stuff anymore. We're seeing multi-decade lows in demand for goods and services, at least in terms of sentiment data and future buying expectations. And then we can look at the credit conditions. We can go back to that chart from Alfonso Pacolito, uh, who has the Macro Compass, and you can find him at Macro Alpha on Twitter. Uh, his blog is free, by the way, so you might want to check that out if you're into stuff like that. And what do we see? These big credit expansions, as you see in blue, usually get unwound because central banks don't continue to ease as much as they need to. They slow the pace of easing, or in the case of quantitative easing, or as we've talked about, is when it does not create lending growth, it has the opposite effect. It tightens financial conditions. And can we start to see some of this in the equity market? Well, we can. We can look here at the percentage of stocks above their 50-day moving average. And when stocks are above their average price for the last 50 days, it's considered bullish. And we're starting to see this thing perhaps roll back over where just a little over 50% of stocks are above its 50-day moving average. Perhaps a more alarming sign, which is considered a very bearish signal, is a percentage of stocks above their 200 day moving average. So looking back over the last 200 days when the price of a stock, in this case, we look at the S&P 500, and we're seeing less than 75% of the S&P 500, um, we see less than, uh, we see a little less than 75% is over, is, I was gonna say under, over its 200 day moving average. Uh, what we're seeing is stocks start to lose steam. And, Due to the market cap weight in the S&P, a number of the stocks can fall below their 200-day moving average, even though the index can still rise. And how about the NASDAQ McClellan Summation Index? This is something you should be paying attention to because it's at a level suggesting there's going to be a big drop. Now you say, Steve, what is the NASI? Well, we go to Investopedia, and what it does is it says it is more suited to intermediate to major trends and related reversals. 
And what it goes on to say, it's used in tactical analysis and can be used to identify bullish or bearish bias as well as strength of the trend. So when we look at this last chart here, the strength of the trend from the NASDAQ is saying that the, that this NASDAQ 100 should be heading lower sooner than going higher. And when it starts to go, when the summation index tends to crash, well, it brings down the entire index with it. But we have another issue that's also suggesting that financial conditions are tightening, and that is unemployment claims. We still, even though we're heading in the right direction now, we see 348,000 claims down 29,000 from last week, so it's heading in the right direction. We should be around 200,000 in a full, healthy economy. But what's the problem? Is in, in 17 days, these pandemic unemployment assistance are going away. And you have right here, eight and a half million people on that alone. And some of those people to the two and seven and a half million of them are gonna lose their state unemployment at the same time. So we have just under 12 million people on some form of unemployment assistance knowing that quite a few of them are going to lose that. Now you say, well, that's not a big deal because the government reports that there's 4 million more jobs. And I, I, this is staggering to me that even at the height of the last expansion, which we did have a minor recession to say that we're in a new expansion, that we now have 4 million more jobs than we did at the peak. And that's going to lead to massive wage growth. Well, apparently the people on un unemployment don't see those big wage growth coming. And while there is a bit of a relationship here that the more jobs that are open, the higher the year over year rate of change in wage growth is, the question is, are these jobs real? And in 17 days, we're gonna find out as all of these people are probably scrambling to look for work. But it doesn't end there because the Atlanta Fed it validates this and says, look, wage growth is just stuck in a trend. It's stuck in a range where it's been since 2016. It's not breaking out higher at all. So the notion that all of these people on unemployment are going to come back into the workforce with even higher wages than they are on unemployment is highly unlikely. When you have less wages and more debt as people took on debt during the pandemic, well, that leads to a situation of less spending. And of course, we can finish up today's show. As you can see now, the financial conditions are set to tighten. We can go to the Philly Fed and we look at this. Now, remember, this is a diffusion index, but keep in mind, it's a percentage, in, percentage of firms indicating an increase minus the percentage of firms indicating a decrease. And what happened? The index slowed a little bit. It's still expanding at a decent clip, but it's starting to slow down. So we see only 19% of firms indicated increase in business activity. New orders were up slightly. Shipments, fewer firms showing an increase. Unfilled orders falling. You wanna see where inflation comes from? It's called unfilled orders. Delivery times slowing. Inventories contracting for the second month. Prices paid up a little bit from the month before. Prices paid, received up. Number of employees up. 32% of firms saying an increase, but not a huge increase based on all these unemployed and the work week up a little bit. So the key to today's show is financial conditions are tightening. We're seeing that now next week, we should get the latest money supply data. And that's probably going to indicate why we're seeing in the commodity space, a lot of stuff slow down because if we look at China. Let's take a look at Chinese stocks here. You're going to see even more. Look at this. You see Chinese stocks are down off of their peak from February and at a point where if they don't stop falling, they tend to plunge. Now, what does that have to do with the S&P 500? You say, well, it should have nothing to do. It has a lot to do because when China's stocks go down a lot, the S&P eventually reacts. And we can look at that in emerging markets too. We can see emerging markets starting to peak and roll over. And when emerging markets start to fall, well, guess what? It brings the S&P down with it. How about gold mining stocks? Many people, big fans of gold mining stocks, but they tend to lead the market lower. Here you can see they started to fall. It took a long time before it brought equity markets down a little bit there, before it brought it down here, before it brought it down here, and here as well. Of course, we'll talk more about that uh, on the Sunday night chart show. And then what about uh, bonds? Yes, we saw, already saw this chart, but we can see when yields start to go down, 
financial conditions are tightening. So the key here is, are yields falling low enough to spur lending growth or are financial conditions soon to tighten at perhaps the worst time as in 17 days, many people are without their unemployment benefits. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. We'll see you back on Sunday. And if not, if you're not a fan of the chart show, no worries. We'll see you on Monday for the show that I do on Mondays. That's not called the show that I can't call it anymore. I'm your host, Steve Edmeter. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching. Bye now. The content of this video is provided educational information only. It's not intended advice, investor, or advice. It's not to be construed as recognition or solicitation, or security, financial, instrument, or participate in particular trading strategies. This video is prepared by Steve Van Meter on personal capacity. Business express this video that I do not reflect the view of Alice Financial Advising or Steve Van Meter Financial.